All right, it is 7 p.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining us tonight for our UX Research and Strategy Meetup. Um, I see we have a lot of newbies, but a lot of uh, returning members as well. So thank you, thank you. Um, just some quick housekeeping things. Please make sure to stay muted. Um, put questions in the chat. We will take them at the end. Um, uh, as always, please share your favorite quotes and insights on, on your favorite social media channels um, and make sure to tag us, hashtag UXRS, so we, that we know and we can follow you back. Um, it looks like other people are, are continuing to add where you're from, but if you are new and joining us, make sure to put where you're from in the chat and uh, that will be awesome. So I'll go ahead and, and get us started tonight. Um, here is the agenda. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about UX research and strategy. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but May is our birthday month. We have been uh, a official meetup for full one year. So we are going to do a little activity related to our birthday. Happy birthday to us. Um, and then we've got the main event, Andy Vitale, changing face of ethical design and why responsible intent matters going to be awesome. Can't wait to get that going. And then at the end, like I mentioned, we'll do Q&A. So again, make sure to put your questions in the chat and we will get to those at the end. All right. So um, if you're new to us, you're probably wondering what's this all about. Um, we are dedicated to teaching, exploring topics related to UX research and strategy. Our goal is to make these topics approachable and actionable by ensuring you come away with concrete examples of how to implement these methods in your daily life, whether that be your work, um, anything outside of work, your volunteering. We want to give you things that you can take back and use right away. So that is what UX Research and Strategy Group is all about, and that's what we're hoping uh, you come away with this evening. All right, so who is involved? Um, at the top there, that is Jen Blatz. She is a UX researcher and designer at Fidelity. In the middle, that's Lori Whitaker, a researcher uh, lead at GitLab. And I am Lauren Singer. I'm a design lead at Capital One. Um, you can see all these lovely ladies, including myself, on the call tonight, uh, answering your questions, um, putting links in the chat, and uh, just generally uh, available to you guys for any, anything you might need. Um, feel free to connect with us on social media as well. All right, so happy birthday, like I mentioned. So, we have been around for one full year. We've got 400 followers on Facebook, 850 on Instagram, almost 16,000 on LinkedIn, 550 on Twitter, all kinds of followers. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for following us. If you haven't yet, please um, follow us tonight. If you're not on all those channels, we really appreciate it. That's how we get really important content and news updates to y'all. We have had 14 meetups four webinars and three workshops. So we have been very, very busy this year um, trying to uh, get the, the best content to you guys in the community. And we so appreciate everything that our members, our followers um, and our attendees have done to make this happen. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's because of you guys that uh, make this group so awesome. So with that in mind, we've got a little bit of a, an activity. So if you've been to a UX research and strategy meetup before, these are, all, these are all the topics that we've covered. And we would love to know what has been your favorite topic. Tell us something that you learned and took back. Put this in the chat. Um, we've done all kinds of things from uh, portfolio reviews, interviews, to very specific methods like jobs to be done and card sorting. Uh, service storming. Um, we've done just some general things like how to how to be a great facilitator, how to understand business strategy. And we want to know which things you liked um, the most, which things you got the most value of. Please, um, please put that in the chat. I see a favorite from Jen is card sort, some interview tips. Awesome. Anyone else come to some events that you really loved? Jobs to be done. Yes, that was last month and that was amazing. Ah, awesome. Product strategy with research. Yeah, that was great. Card sorting. Networking. Yeah, very good. It's been a little bit difficult to network here in our virtual world, but um, we've been thinking of ways that we can do that uh, virtually as well. 
Delta CX, yes, Debbie Levitt. Great. Very cool. Service storming, jobs be done. Yeah, lot, lots for jobs be done. That one was last month and that one was very popular. We've got um, some of these recordings on YouTube, including jobs to be done. Um, we have also, if you go to our website, you can see the um, slides for all of these things. Great question from Carol. Delta CX is a book that Debbie Levitt wrote and she came to talk to us about some of those things, uh, the things in her book. Um, hers was um, Stop Evangelizing UX and What to Do Instead. It was awesome. We also had a webinar with, with Debbie. That was great. Awesome. Yeah, please definitely visit our website, um, uxresearchandstrategy.com to see um, more about each of these things. But thank you for sharing your favorites. All right. Next uh, activity related to our birthday, we've had a full year of awesome, awesome topics. And we want to know from you guys, what other topics related to UX research and strategy do you want to learn about? So go ahead and throw in the chat some ideas of things that you would like to see um, us provide you in the next year. Let's, let's hear some ideas. And now we wait. Yeah, the great, great point, Lori. Like uh, this is, we try to get information from you guys as researchers. We want to look to our main users and get ideas for what things might help you the most. So definitely please um, put your ideas in the chat. All right, UX post COVID, interesting. UX strategy and metrics. Yeah, definitely, that would be great. Okay, we've got some for leadership, remote research. No budget research, absolutely. Who here has a huge, huge research budget? Not many of us. Remote design sprint, a lot of remote stuff. This is great. Uh, lucky for you guys um, on our staff, Lori Whitaker is a fully remote researcher. So she's got a lot to say about this topic, it'd be great. Experimental design diary studies, great. So I'm gonna um, go forward to the next slide, but please keep your ideas coming, put them in the chat. What are the things that you would like to see? Um, this is definitely gonna help us uh, fill up the next year with things that are gonna be great for you guys. All right, so um, just an update from our group. We, earlier this year, we had a career series uh, complete with four different topics. The two on the right, how to build a research portfolio and um, master your UX job interview, those were uh, by ticket only, but we figured out a way to put them on Vimeo and they're available for purchase. So go ahead and check out our Vimeo. It's vimeo.com uh, slash UXRS. Um, the links are also in the chat, thanks to, thanks to Jen. And those are available if you are looking for a job uh, or just wanna keep your uh, research portfolio and interviewing skills up to date. Check those out. They were awesome, awesome, awesome. Our next UX research and strategy event is going to be amazing. It's June 2nd. How do NASA spacesuit engineers apply human-centric design? This one's gonna be great. Um, it's featuring Amy J. Ross from NASA, and this one is a free online event. Uh, check out our Eventbrite um, for the link or just go to our website events and uh, it's also in the chat. Um, this one's gonna be amazing, it's next month. Please um, join us for that one as well. And I mentioned this earlier, but definitely have to do another plug. Um, follow us on social media. We've got LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Twitter, um, and Instagram. We also do have a Slack channel. If you'd like to join us, reach out on social media and we'll get you into that Slack channel. This is a place where you can ask questions, um, get tips and tricks, talk to other people, network, uh, learn about job postings or other events um, happening in the community. So um, please let us know if you'd like to be part of our Slack channel. Um, also, yeah, Lori just mentioned email us at ux.research.and.strategy at gmail.com uh, to get access to the Slack channel as well. Also, uh, if you'd like to support our group, uh, your school, your 
um, business or you personally, please visit our website and learn more about how you may help us bring more events to you guys and keep them free or low cost. All right, and at the end of this, we will definitely uh, send out a follow-up survey. So please complete it. That helps us keep our content really high quality and get uh, even more ideas from you guys. So when you see this come through, I'd love if you could take just two minutes out of your uh, evening or morning, wherever you're located and fill this out. And without further ado, we are now at our main event uh, with tonight's speaker, Andy Vitale. He is a design leader, speaker, and educator. He's solved complex problems for organizations ranging from startups to fortune ranked companies, and is currently doing so in the finance industry. Aside from his primary role at Truist, Andy, uh, Andy is an adjunct professor for Kent State University's User Experience Design graduate program and serves on the advisory board for multiple professional organizations and educational institutions. So without further ado, I will unmute Andy, stop sharing my screen and let him take over. Thank you so much, Andy, and welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Um, happy whatever day today has morphed into since we've uh, been home most of the time. Anyway, um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'm gonna move my microphone in front of me, so it might look weird, but it'll sound better. So yeah, I really, one year, that's a great thing. This is such a great group, almost 16,000 people on LinkedIn. It's super impressive, I'm really excited to be here. Now, if we were in person, what I would do is ask you all to stand up if you were able to, we won't do that now, and raise your dominant hand and get some high fives going around the room. But we could virtually high five, but while I have to set up Zoom plus Keynote to share my presentation, why don't we throw some virtual high fives in the chat right now to give me like 30 seconds to figure out how to do this again. Um, I'm going to go to share screen. I'm going to say this out loud. So while you're high-fiving, I'll be talking myself through the instructions that I have to do. Um, and we are half good. And I am going to now ask if you can see what you're supposed to see. Okay, I see, I see some thumbs up, I see nods, I love it. All right, so again, everybody, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I, I wish we could have done it in person. One day we will, I promise. Um, I am going to now, all right, we're, we're good. So by a, a quick nod, I see a few people in the chat maybe. How many of you know who this is? So this is Bat Boy. Bat Boy is a fictional character that was created by American media. So way back in the day, I worked for a company that created really interesting pieces of literature, such as the National Enquirer. So I worked for the company that created the Inquirer, the Sun, the Star, Weekly World News, and they created uh, Bat Boy. And I remember the, having the opportunity to uh, just be in that newspaper. We, it, it was fake and we got paid like $20 extra in our paycheck to be somebody in that paper. And, and I happened to be like the president of the Liberace fan club in the newspaper. And one of my friends were in there and it was like, we thought we were awesome. And it was one of my first jobs. It wasn't my absolute first, but I was in charge of all of the pre-press for that work. And the reason I, I'm starting with this story is because while I worked there, we were also subject to the first anthrax attack in the United States. Literally somebody mailed a picture of JLo with a soapy substance and our photo editor opened it and he died. Now, that was before this, we were literally the first anthrax attack back when that started happening in 2001. And I remember there were people in hazmat suits in the office and it was just, 
it was a really weird time. And then I, I was one of the last people out of the building on a Friday night. And I remember getting a phone call from my dad that Monday morning. And he said, Hey, your company is on the news. You're supposed to go down to the health department. They didn't call me to tell me that. I found out from my dad who saw it on the news. I went down to the health department. They said, hey, we're going to have you sign a bunch of paperwork. Um, we're going to test you for anthrax. We're going to, you know, if anything's not right, we'll, we'll do the best we can to treat it. So they took a nasal swab. They shuffled us into a hotel ballroom, and they had the FBI, the CDC, and the Florida Department of Health, and they sat us down. And they said, we honestly, and, and this is all I remember, so it might be not 100% word for word, but the gist of it was, we honestly don't know if you're going to live or die. We had an, the only anthrax outbreak we knew of was in Russia in the 60s, and the spores stay dormant for 58 days. So we're going to give you 60 days of medication of Cipro, and we're going to monitor to you. And just, that was like, super scary like everything that's going on now has been triggering that moment in my life uh, and I didn't even realize that I had such a, an emotional attachment to this experience that I had I thought I had completely blocked it out but anyway so we would then get swabbed on a say we'd have to go in on a Wednesday and they would call us on a Thursday they would tell us everything looks great and then we'd hear the special alert tone on the news and realize that another coworker was hospitalized for anthrax. And then they'd call us back on Friday and say, uh, the tests were inconclusive. We're going to have to have you come back next week and test again. And what that made me realize is something was wrong. Uh, I was new to design, but I realized that the way things were being communicated to me, they could be there could be a better job. And me as a designer, is there a way that I could do that? Now, I didn't think that immediately that happened over a few years. And what that led to for me is being primarily focused on ethical design for at least the last five or six years. And where that started for me, um, right now I work in finance and I work for Truist. Originally I was at SunTrust. We went through a merger that happened in December. I was the head of UX at SunTrust, and my goal was to help businesses have a better relationship with their money and help them financial confidence. Now at Truist, I'm standing up emerging design practices, and what that means is whenever the organization feels that something needs to be spun up to elevate design or to solve problems, I'm doing that. So I'm standing up an enterprise design team, a design advocacy team. I help stand up some journey design and a lot of our innovation work that's going on on the design side. Um, previous to that, I was the director of design impact for the AIGA in Minnesota. And what that meant is design for good and the sustainable design committees fell under me. So I was focused on how do we improve community? How do we improve sustainability? How do we just do good with design? And before that, while I was in Minnesota, I was working in the healthcare space. So I worked for 3M. And 3M is not just Scott tape and post-it notes. Uh, although we did have a, a huge closet full of post-it notes that is a designer's dream, 3M makes physical and digital solutions for both patients, payers, and providers. Everything from oral care to infection prevention to food safety. And eventually, I stood up a team that was focused on enterprise software that was used in hospitals. So I've, I've really seen the ability of design to solve complex problems and, and do good for people. And we definitely have the opportunity to do that still. And we're seeing that more and more every day. But the truth is, no matter where you are in your career, being a designer is a privilege. When you're in a position to make a difference, when you have the opportunity to do so, that impact is so inspiring. It really makes me love what I do and getting up and going to work every day and trying to help people and what problems can I help solve today and how to make the world a better place and do I have a, a little like, what is my, my hobby even is like, how do we help people in, in some way or another? And I just think the way the design community tries to gather 
behind each other. And I'm not talking about like designer Twitter and some of the bickering that goes on, which, which isn't really that big of a deal. It's, we, we need to do better as a community for sure. But really, this has been such a great community to embrace younger designers, emerging designers, the, the whole community to help them. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. So, you know, like I said, it's about making things better. And designers, we recognize that there's always a path to improve the current state. And to be able to do so through meaningful context really showcases that power of design. I've got a super hot heat lamp on, so I'm just gonna sip a little uh, this new Coca-Cola apple ginger sparkling water and probably make weird noises as it goes down. So I apologize in advance. But, you know, as we talk about, it's a choice we've made to be designers and we're choosing to impact people that come in contact with our work. And as designers, the products, the services, the experiences that we create, we have the ability to help people or hurt them with what we create, with our actions. Whatever we work on, the tools, the solutions, the products, like I mentioned, it has an exponential impact, whether it's functional, emotional, or in my case today, financial. And as designers, we're not just pushing pixels and worried about a single screen, but we're designing applications, we're designing organizations, we're designing ecosystems, we're working on complex things and solving problems that affect people's lives. We affect people's relationships, we affect their mental state. Designers have the privilege, which sometimes can be a burden, of wielding a lot more power than we have ever had in the existence of our profession. When we do our jobs well, we make people's lives better. When we don't, people can get hurt. And the truth is, people want to feel insecure. Safety is a basic human right. But there's a lot of shit that's going on in this world right now that doesn't allow them to. It seems we're constantly hearing of new breaches from all industries, and that's not good. And it's not just breaches. Some of it is improper practices. And none of these are solely the fault of the company, but the customers don't always understand that. We have to learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past. We have to acknowledge them, learn from them, and move on from them. I'm not saying that all of these things that you're looking at could have been avoided by design, but I am saying that people deserve to feel safe and design can play a big part in that. And sometimes we leverage technology for the wrong reason. This is a video, there might be sound. If you hear sound, give me a thumbs up. If you don't hear sound, I will talk over it. Okay, so there's no sound. So this is a walkway in China that when people walk over it, there is an LED screen that acts like it's cracking. It makes the sound and the view of it cracking. Now, these people are scared for their life right now because they think the ground is literally cracking underneath them. Can you imagine not knowing and walking along this walkway? Why would a designer think it was a good idea to design something that would cause this type of fear in people? I mean, whether it's a prank or not, this is not something that we should be condoning as designers and signing up to do. This wasn't a good idea. People seem to have quickly figured out that it wasn't real, but let's take that a step further. On Saturday morning, January 13th, 2018, and I'm sure you've seen this before, a ballistic missile alert was issued by the emergency alert commercial mobile alert system in Hawaii. And this alert went out over television, over radio, over cell phones in the United States state of Hawaii. This alert stated that there was an incoming ballistic missile threat to Hawaii. It advised residents to seek immediate shelter and concluded that this wasn't a Think about that for one second. Like, imagine you get a text alert on your phone, and I just pull up my phone anyway, and you literally realize that there's... 
doom coming for you that you immediately fear, right? Like what's happening? Am I going to live? Am I going to die? Like your brain goes in all different places. Now, this alert system scared people. And the truth is, for 38 minutes, people lived with this fear. It wasn't until 38 minutes later that state officials blamed a miscommunication during a, dr a drill for the first message. The people weren't aware this was a problem for, I'm going to round up, for almost an hour. Can you imagine that? It turns out we can say it was a bit of a design problem. There's, there's debates around that. But at the start of each shift, operators open up their software. They retrieve a list of saved templates, and they have to choose from a list of nine. This time, the file they picked was named PACCOM CDW state only. That's the one that they need to pick. The template though, or, or that's the one that they actually picked. The template that they needed to do for the test was, had the same name except for the word drill in front of it. It was drill PACCOM CDW state only. Other than the word drill in the file name, they were nearly identical and they were actually not organized in a way that makes sense to anyone. This is a design problem involving file naming conventions, and in this case, an error like this caused widespread fear and panic. Now, you know, there's been some debate over, is this the actual screen that they saw or how the information was organized, but this is, you know, it was widely shared outside. And it, it's just amazing that a designer didn't think to realize that this layout or this organization of information would potentially cause a problem down the line. And I'm just saying that us as designers, as researchers, as uh, information architects, as UX designers, visual designers, interaction designers, whatever our discipline is, strategists, we need to be aware of these things to become better designers and create better solutions. You know, four years ago, technology companies were widely seen as having a positive impact on the United States, but that view has really gone downhill. It's tumbled 21 percentage points from 71% to 50% over the past four years. And that means that only half of Americans feel that technology companies has a, have a positive impact on the United States. I would love to see this data taken one more time now in light of everything that's going on and how we've kind of been forced to embrace technology to live our everyday lives but i still don't feel that people completely trust it and i wonder why even trusted brands brands that we love we trust we believe in we think are great they're making mistakes the apple card i love my apple card I use it all the time. It's my primary card. I was so excited when I got it. I actually, I, I'm such an Apple fanboy. I never took it out of the package. It's still like in the original like foldable cardboard. And I don't know, one day maybe I'll frame it. I should probably do it now because you don't have credit card numbers on it. But anyway, like I, you know, working in finance, I'm like, this is cool. The design is great. But how many of you remember seeing their sexist algorithm? So basically what we were finding out is men who submitted for the Apple card were given a higher credit limit than women, even if the women had higher credit scores. And this was true at the time in my house. My wife's credit limit is lower than mine and her credit is better than mine. Um, why do things like this happen? Even Steve Wozniak called out like, hey, same thing happened to him. This is the founder of Apple, and he had the same problem. I mean, he's not working there now, but I mean, I don't know. And, and Apple blamed Goldman Sachs and Goldman Sachs, and nobody really knows how it happened, but they investigated it. And why does this happen? Well, what you're looking at is a list of technologies that were not well understood. They still might not be today. But as designers, as researchers, as people working in that technology, as developers, 
we had to figure out what this technology was capable of doing the same time we're actually designing in it. While you can definitely argue the need for speed, going too fast can potentially blur the original purpose. I think we need to slow down. We need to measure what our work is doing out there in the world and the impact that it has on people's lives. Otherwise, if we're just designing blindly, we're gonna realize when it's too late that there was a capability we weren't aware of that caused harm. Can anyone throw in the chat a couple of technologies that I might be missing while I grab another sip? Okay, I can't, I, I've, I'm not seeing the chat, so I'm assuming, I'm trusting that you all are doing it as a code of people who work in the design industry. I can think of them that I missed. Flying cars. While they're not here today, we have to really understand what that capability is. I, and you know what? You're seeing them pop up here and there. They're not commercially available, but you could do a Google search for flying cars, and there are cars that are actually working and flying. But sometimes when we make these mistakes, it's like, holy shit, I cannot believe that happened. In today's world of artificial intelligence, in natural language processing engines, this is a Facebook notification. So, you know, you get the alert, what happened a year ago, your most liked photo, whatever that happened to be. This person's most loved photo from 2016 was about them sharing their mother's death. And Facebook literally put hearts and a character that literally danced on their mother's death, on their mother's grave. A person designed this algorithm and a person made the decision to implement this. Technology by itself does not have a conscious. It doesn't have context. It doesn't have a soul. Technology is an enabler, and design helps apply technology in a meaningful way. Alan Cooper says, the individuals who create some of the most oppressive digital systems are mostly good people. They are doing good work for seemingly good reason, yet what they're creating can turn against anyone purposefully willing to use it. And that is so true. The Spotify design team talks about there being three types of harm to the people that we design for. There's physical harm. When we think about physical harm, don't think so much about like something falling on you or like worst case scenario. Think about the things that are more subtle. Think about inactivity because you're addicted to a device. Think about sleep deprivation because of the glare of the screen or every time we wake up, we check our email or we get involved in, in something else that's going on, our work emails or a notification. People who have vertigo have problems with the parallaxing screens that we see so often in the design community. We've enabled addictive UI. We've got infinite scroll feeds. We have auto queued videos. We've got a ton of things that are competing for your attention. We also have this exposure to your personally identifiable data. When features share a person's exact location, I'm sure you've all gone in and, and seen how Google has captured in Google Maps where you go every day and the time you go there and how long it takes to get there and how it tracks you. If people had access to that information, they can definitely find you. Uh, and we've seen cases of stalking based on geolocation. And then there are accidents that are due to distraction, especially while people are driving. Again, this is all back to attention. And then there is emotional harm. Emotional harm is about the betrayal of trust or privacy. When people are exploited, when people are exposed, when they're discriminated against using information about them that they thought was private, that is such a feeling of being violated. And then beyond that, we've got negative self-image, anxiety, depression, especially against uh, amongst young people. I've never seen bullying and suicide rates the way that I see it today. These young people, their minds, their bodies, their ideas are still in development. 
they had to crave social acceptance. Yet we have designs and technology that, that are just taking advantage of that. And then there's societal implications. There's political polarization. And we're seeing that for sure. Uh, algorithms that flatten the landscape of journalism that drive news agencies to create news through sensationalism and contribute to a divided society. And then there's exclusion. It's that failing to develop features sensitive to the experiences of underrepresented users and those who are, have mental or physical disabilities. And then there's the reinforcement of stereotypes and structural oppression, which is due to a growing dependence on algorithms and data to classify and make predictions about people. Sure, it's great when things are personalized and data goes from, you know, analog to connected to eventually predictive. And, and some of those outcomes are great, but we have to be aware of the potential when outcomes cannot be that great all the time. So Harry Brignall created a term that was originally coined as dark patterns. And these were meant to explain ways that we've tricked customers into conversion. I believe we can do better with a more inclusive term, and I like to call it harmful patterns. And we've already seen ways that we've created things that have caused damage to people. But there are even more ways that us as designers, we trick people. And sometimes we design screens and interactions that have these dirty tricks to influence their behavior to achieve a specific result. I used to have a big beard. I shaved it off. Now it's, uh, I guess we'll go with ombre. It's ombre colored. Uh, it's uh, grown back. It's about two months now. So I beard oil and, and I love pumpkin spice. Like pumpkin spice season is my all time favorite season. I went to buy pumpkin spice beard oil and I landed on this website and it told me that six of these were sold in the last 24 hours. I was like, wow, uh, people are buying it. It must be decent. I don't see reviews, but okay. Uh, then it's telling me that they have 75 out of a hundred sold. Like, wait a minute. I better this because they're almost out and 10 people are already viewing this product. That means there's only 15 left if all those people buy it. Like I have to throw this in my cart and you know what? The deal ends in just a few hours. So I have to buy this. I scrambled for my credit card. I was like, I got to get this. Telling my wife, like, I found pumpkin spice beard oil and it's, you know, it's only $7.99. And she's like, oh, it can't be that good for that price. But anyway, I, I was like, all right, I'll do it. I accidentally like stumbled on my computer and I hit the refresh button. And when I hit that refresh button, all of that information changed. There were, you know, 20 sold in 24 hours and there were, 15 people viewing the product and they had 50 left that false sense of urgency that they created because they may run out or the offer will expire will probably help sell them a few. But at the end of the day, is it really worth tricking your customer into that? Because as soon as I hit refresh, I was like, well, this is a joke. I still bought it because it was $8 pumpkin spice beard oil, but uh, I wish I didn't. It was, uh, wasn't great. And then I also bought pumpkin spice deodorant. Not my proudest moment, but I definitely found this company called Native. They create all natural deodorant. And I was like, this company seems ethical. They're natural. It's also pumpkin spice. You know, let me do that. And what happened is I ended up getting, I don't know, two emails the next day about their new flavors of like lavender and cherry blossom and nothing that was like relevant to what I needed, but two emails. I'm like, okay, I just ordered. That's great. The next day I'd get another two emails and that continued for like three weeks before I was like, this is just too much. I, as much as I like this company, I, I have to unsubscribe to these emails. So I went to unsubscribe and this is the message that I got. Somehow a designer thought it would be a good idea to guilt me into not unsubscribing. I have two dogs. They're tiny compared to this dog, but I love my dogs and I wouldn't want them to be sad. 
I did not. I really debated unsubscribing because I did not want Muppet to be sad if I unsubscribed. I fell for the trick for a second. I thought I was going to have to like donate to animals or something when I saw this pop up. But ultimately, it just, it felt dirty, right? And you think, where did designers get this pattern from? You know, what makes someone think that was a good idea? Well, the truth is, they learn it from somewhere else. Facebook has done this. Facebook, back in the day when you wanted to deactivate your account, they would show some of your friends and tell your friends they would miss you if you canceled the, your account. And, you know, I went to cancel. Well, I didn't, but imagine going to cancel your Facebook account, deactivate it, and you see that Bridget will miss you and Megan will miss you. I don't even know, like, Megan that well. Or Chris will miss me. I haven't followed Chris since he had three kids because I look at Chris's kids every time I log on to Facebook, so I've muted him. But still, he's, he's going to be sad if I, you know, his kids are going to cry if I, if I unsubscribe or if I cancel my Facebook account. You know, public shaming is not the way to get people to behave the way you want them to. There's a way to enforce behavior and there's a right way to do things. You know, we hear the word ethics thrown around a lot. And I want to define the most basic dictionary definition which is the discipline of dealing with what is good or bad and with moral duty and obligation. That really sums it up pretty easily. I have a question. How many of your teams or you yourself have your own set of personal design principles or your own design philosophy that you really believe in? Do you have an ethical compass? I hope that we all do. Now, how do we apply that to design? And I basically went to uh, another reference, encyclopedia.com, and figured that design ethics are what guides us, how we work as designers with clients, with our colleagues, with the end users of the products, how we conduct the design process, how we determine the features of products, and how we assess the ethical significance or moral worth of the products that result from the activity of designing. So I wanna take that question one step further. Do you actually have a moral line in the sand when it comes to creating products? Is there something that, a line that you won't cross when somebody says, we should do this, and you will stand up and say, that's not right. And I want us to be aware of these because these situations happen. As designers, we really need to understand the potential consequences of our actions. I know that we all have paychecks that we rely on, but doing so at the expense of society and the people that we share our planet with is just wrong. I bring up Facebook a lot because they've done a lot of stupid shit over the years. In 2014, Facebook ran an experiment on over 600,000 of the people who use their, surface, their, their service, and they filled their news feeds with nothing but negative news to see how it affected people's mental health without their consent, without a way to opt out, not even a way to opt out for those people with mental health issues. Imagine if every day you opened up Facebook, all you saw were negative news. I mean, that kind of seems like the times we're living in right now. Uh, but, you know, we do get to see those, those good news, too. And I, I thank uh, Jim from The Office for uh, a daily burst of good news that I get to watch as often as I can. But it's not just about the screens that we design. It's about the business models underneath them. And it's not just about business models. It's about technical and economic structures that enable them. It shouldn't have to be a choice we make, whether it's for the good of our company versus the greater good of people. But sometimes company goals don't always align with making the world a better place. And sometimes we say no harm, no foul, right? Let's take a look at a common hypothetical in the future. Autonomous vehicles. They're basically here. And you've, you may have heard this before and you may have thought about it before, but I really want you to take a minute and think about this. Let's say for one minute 
there's going to be an accident involving two vehicles. At some point, the vehicle has to know to make a decision to react to something. What causes that vehicle to react? Is there going to be a point that the vehicle manufacturer says, well, this is an autonomous Mercedes. This person has money. They're better for society than the person in the old Chrysler that they're going to hit. So you know what? Let's go ahead and, and make sure that our car, our driver is safe. That's just something we have to be aware of that could potentially happen. Think about it one step further. Let's say that there's somebody walking in the street and the car has no choice but to hit somebody. It's accident. It's swerving to create, to save the driver. It's going to hit a person. Does it then decide, do I hit the car in front or do I swerve and hit the, the pedestrian? Which person will technology try to save? How will it be determined? Will it be by insurance type, by age, by the car manufacturer, by somebody's net worth? Will we be able to scan a person, maybe scan the amount of money in their wallet, something that through technology, we know there are certain things that people do and want to achieve. And, and I'm presenting a bit of a dystopian future, but ultimately, I mean, somebody's going to have to make that call. What will the software do? Hopefully we can figure it out and put safety measures in there. Every human being on this earth should strive to do their best to leave this planet or any other planet in a lot better shape than we found it. The term design here in sustainable design is used to refer to practices that are applied to how we make products, services, as well as businesses stable or able to last and continue into the future. What's the impact of our work on the world's environment? the resources, the climate. We're seeing now our climate, things we haven't seen in years. We're seeing, you know, the mountains in India. We're seeing holes in the ozone layer that are being repaired. And, you know, some can argue the earth does that on its own over time. And, and some can say it's because we haven't been using as many natural resources as we have in the past. But ultimately, we have to think about how we can have positive environmental impact. And one of the things I wanna talk about is play pumps. And I don't know if you're familiar with play pumps, but play pumps provides water pumps for African villages. And it really does sound like a marketing dream. Celebrities, presidents, rappers, I mean, Jay's invested in this. Children go on a merry-go-round and they play as children do. And while doing that, water is pumped from the ground for storage in elevated tanks. Now let's not talk about the child labor and safety right now. Let's, let's put that aside for a second. This wasn't a success. It sounds like a great idea. The recommended minimum daily water requirement is 15 liters per person, which based on that pump's capability would require children to be playing nonstop for 27 hours a day. It's just not possible. The pumps were also expensive. They were about $14,000 per pump and super hard to maintain. It turned out that the, for the cost of one play pump, you could provide four conventional wells with hand pumps that are far cheaper, more sustainable, easy to repair, and still provide water without these pumps. And as designers, we know not everything goes as planned. And sometimes we need to learn from our mistakes. I mentioned that earlier. The UN just recently published a list of sustainable goals. You're actually lucky that you won't be able to hear the music that goes along with this, but I want you to be familiar with these goals because this is a list of wicked problems that we can all get behind and try to solve. I'm just going to call out how angry I am that they're not going in order, that it's just random numbers. But as designers, these are such 
interesting problems that if we had the ability or the bandwidth or the opportunity to start to tackle, like, this is work and this is valuable work. And this is the type of work that a lot of us do and a lot of us will do in our careers. And again, it, it's all about the privilege of being a designer and, and being able to have an impact on the world. And I hear the music, so me voicing over it is a little bit creeping me out. So I'll just let this keep going. So another term that we've been hearing a lot about when we talk about how to design responsibly is universal design. And it's a framework for the design of living and working spaces and products that benefit the widest possible range of people in the widest range of situations without special or separate design for them. And, you know, the best example I could give of universal design to teach it to you in, in a slide or two is a curb cut. Sidewalks with curb cuts are a great example because they make it easier for lots of people, people in wheelchairs, people with walkers, people walking with a stroller or a shopping cart or anyone really. I mean, it reduces the likelihood of tripping. So by creating something that potentially made one group of people's lives better, it essentially made everybody's lives better. Another example are doors that open automatically when a person moves near them. And according to the World Bank, approximately 1 billion people worldwide live with a disability, which actually makes them the world's largest minority. In the US, it's about one in five people or 20% of our population that have a disability. And we talk about accessible design. And oddly enough, most of the time, at least up until a few years ago, the only time you really heard about it is when the company was being sued. And then they were like, all right, we have to make our design more accessible so that we don't get sued. And that really shifted the focus. And now we've got teams and people that are dedicated to making the most accessible design that we can have. And, you know, designing from an accessibility standpoint, accessibility first has the potential to not just benefit people with disabilities, but larger groups of people, because we know that accessible design typically delivers a better user experience. Many products we use every day were originally designed for people with disabilities. Now, lots of companies have gotten sued over the years. Target, $6 million. Morgan Stanley, $9 million. Wells Fargo, $16 million. It's the lawsuits were common. Even Apple has been sued over accessibility in the past. And some of the products that have come out through understanding people with accessibility or people who need accessible design and accessible products are products that we're familiar with every day. SMS texting, just text messaging was originally developed for the deaf to communicate without a phone. The telephone itself was created out of Alexander Graham Bell's desire to create a hearing device because both his wife and his mother were. And how many times do we listen to audiobooks? Audiobooks are a great example of something that you don't need to actually look at the pages to read. It helps people with visual impairment. Voice command technology is everywhere today and it's become extremely helpful for blind people. Um, you know, fidget spinners were originally designed to help kids with autism. And my favorite product of all time that if it wasn't so light, I'd probably be wearing right now, the Snuggie. The Snuggie was created for disabled people who happen to be in wheelchairs. It made it easier for them to put on this robe or, or blanket. So these are just some of what we've gotten to, to leverage uh, because we've designed these for people that are different than us. Uh, Apple again was sued at one time and they've really been raising the bar for designing features and products. Now, this is like a minute to three minute Apple video. I'm gonna skip it because you won't be able to hear it, but I recommend everybody go on YouTube and look at the Apple accessibility video and it shows how they created this whole video using Apple's accessibility features. Um, 
another term that's getting a ton of buzz right now is inclusive design and everybody's talking like it's it's such a new word term has been around since 2005 it was created by the british standards institute and it talks about the design of mainstream products and services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible without any need for special adaptation or specialized design so when we look at a video like this, I'm going to narrate what's happening here. This is a light skinned hand going under a soap dispenser and soap is coming out. When somebody with darker skin puts their hand under the soap dispenser, it doesn't dispense any soap. And like anyone else, people create a workaround. How do we enable this to work for us based on the way it was currently designed? So if a dark skinned hand puts a white paper cloth on their hand, it dispenses soap. Without that, I mean, this is crazy to me. I didn't know. I didn't mean to, isn't good enough. It's 2020. If you don't understand the people who could potentially use your product and include them the way that you design, then you really don't deserve the right to call yourself a designer or somebody that works in the design industry. As designers, as researchers, as humans, it's your obligation to respect every other human being and their time their intentions, their privacy, and their intelligence. Victor Pavanek says, you're responsible for what you put into the world and you're responsible for the effect those things have upon the world. In order to prevent repeating mistakes, we have to learn from them. I'm gonna take a look at a mistake that was made in my industry many years ago. It's something that a lot of you may be familiar with, just by a quick, I'm not going to do a show of hands because we can't, but how many of you think to yourself, know someone who has owned a home and had a mortgage before? Beginning in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration refused to insure mortgages in and near African-American neighborhoods. Same time, the, FF, the FHA was subsidizing builders who were building entire subdivisions for white people with the requirement that none of the homes be sold to African-Americans. Their justification was that if African-Americans bought homes in these suburbs, the property values of the white homes they were insuring would decline and their loans would be at risk. Redlining. This was a term coined by a sociologist McKnight in the 60s. It describes the process of banks and other institutions refusing to offer mortgages or offering worse rates to customers in certain neighborhoods based on their racial and ethnic composition. Areas such as black, non-white, inner city neighborhoods were outlined in red. Investigations found that lenders would make loans to lower income white people, but not to middle or upper income people of color. These residential security maps, and you can look them up for almost every city, that was around between the night around the 1900s uh, they helped the government decide which neighborhoods would make secure investments and which should be off limits for issuing mortgages and the maps were color coded green means it was best it was an area that represented it was in demand it was up and coming this is where professional men lived blue was still there but kind of reached its peak it was thought to be stable because there was a low risk of infiltration by non-white groups. And then yellow was definitely declining. Most of these areas bordered neighborhoods populated by people of color and were considered risky due to the threat of infiltration of foreign born black or lower grade populations. And red was hazardous. These were neighborhoods where infiltration had occurred Almost all of them populated by non-white residents were ineligible for FHA backing. And again, like city after city, 
the Fair Housing Act of 1968. It took until 1968 to put an end to legally sanctioned redlining policies. But again, not until 1975 did the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act encourage banks to actually lend money in these areas and record document their lending practices. But effects of redlining were still being felt. Denial rates for non-white people in Mississippi are still disproportionate as late as 2008, and it's starting to come around a little bit. Many homes, though, are no longer affordable to families who could have afforded them back then when white people were buying into those suburbs and gaining the equity and wealth that followed from that. It's, it's just crazy. And I'd like to think that we're past that now because surely the people that we allowed to make that decision, we won't allow them to make those decisions again because technology won't allow us to make these same decisions but actually, technology are being designed by people that could potentially have unconscious bias. We're seeing technology sometimes streamline some of these same mistakes that we've made in the past. You know, are we past this? Well, Facebook got in trouble with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for discriminatory ad practices. For years, they were allowing people to target or avoid targeting protected groups like minorities or specific gender identities. This is illegal. They looked into it and said it would stop. It didn't. In most buyers, if most home buyers in an area were white, for instance, Facebook might only show ads to white users. Housing companies were illegally and allegedly using Facebook's ad targeting options to prevent their apartment listings from being seen by the social networks of older users. Last year, Facebook said it would stop allowing advertisers in key categories to show their messages to only people of a certain race, a certain gender, or a certain age group. 2019, Facebook said they would stop this. Why was this going on for so long? And have they actually stopped it? So you have to think, if you're creating something, what's the worst that can happen? Think about that. Before you actually implement something, let it go live, make sure you sit down and think what is truly the worst that can happen. How many of you remember the name James Leung? Does anybody recognize that name? James was an engineer who worked for Volkswagen for over 20 years. James was a company man. In 2017, James was sentenced to 40 months in prison because he designed software to cheat emissions testing. This is precedent now. Designers, developers, engineers, researchers, people that are involved in making bad decisions that harm other people can be held accountable. People are going to jail for this. So we need to ask ourselves and our partners to create responsible guidelines for our products so that we can embed responsibility into our process. We know the typical design discovery. We always ask, but just to align, What's the problem we're trying to solve? Who are we actually solving it for? Who are the users? The context is very important. Understanding from a research perspective, from a design perspective, how it's actually used as opposed to how it was intended to be used is key for us. When I was in healthcare, I worked on site at a, a hospital when we were designing software. And I noticed that these medical coders, they were printing out people's patients documents their charts they were emailing it they were skyping they were screen sharing with phi not because they didn't know better but because out of necessity the solution that they had didn't support their workflow and they had to find workarounds for that as soon as our research team went in there we found a way to like safely share these products and these screens and the phi but in the meantime, people are just gonna, they're gonna do what they do. They're gonna find a way to make it work. So we need to make sure that we're aware of how it's intended to be used. Think about the problem that we're trying to solve. Ask yourself, literally, what's the worst thing that can happen and how do you prevent it? What if it's used by different people, the wrong people? Think about that solution you're exploring right now. Think about the product or service that you're creating. What if it's used in a different context or for another purpose? 
Think about the people who will use your design, who can access that design. More importantly, who can't access that design? What can we do? How can we think about things to ensure that we're helping to improve things rather than making them worse or flat out destroying them? So quick list for the people that want to take a screenshot. Um, these are some best practices for responsible design. I'm going to take a sip while you do that. And we'll go into each one. Prioritize usability. Understand how people intend to use your products and ensure they meet their needs. We have an obligation as designers to create products that are intuitive, that are safe, that are free from potential life-threatening errors, free from harm. We need to design to accommodate all users with a wide variety of diverse abilities and think about privacy and safety equally available to all people and their individual preferences. And one of the most basic things if you're designing something ergonomically a mouse, think about how you accommodate right-handed, left-handed users. Have good intentions, be transparent, be well-intentioned, put the well-being of others before your place of employment. Being able to help people is a great opportunity. Actually helping them is a reward. Connect to your organization's mission and values and hold your company accountable to them too. It's okay to question or challenge the current business model. Look to redesign it. Look to design a new business model if you have to. Throughout our design process, we know we use the scientific method. We make assumptions for decisions that we make. Remember these are assumptions. Don't get married to the design. Understand their limitations and where potential risks lie. Test those assumptions. While our assumptions are the known unknowns, there is always risks that we aren't aware of. The only way we can identify these is by seeking to be proven wrong, being shown what we missed and learning from that to make our designs better. 70 degrees, 90 something, I can't see the actual clock, 44%. Those are all pieces of data that are utterly worthless by themselves. Even when more relevant, like I said, data doesn't have a moral compass. Let's not be data driven. Let's be data informed so that we can make better decisions to improve the human experience. And let's tolerate mistakes. Although we want to minimize accidental errors and actions, we have to embrace people who make mistakes. Let them feel appreciated. Let them feel loved. Let them feel welcomed on our website, in our application, in the experience that we create. Help them learn from their mistakes so that they can avoid repeating them. And let us as design practitioners, design professionals, learn from their mistakes as well. We need to bring people to the center of our process. We have to work with humans to understand them and both identify and uncover their articulated and unarticulated needs. We need to be empathetic to their situation and develop a relationship with them so we can continue to help them and learn how to help them. We need to be welcoming and encouraging of people who come from diverse backgrounds and cultures. We need to make space at the table for marginalized voices to be heard. We know that diversity leads to better outcomes, better solutions, and better products which means that diversity leads to better design for everyone. Kim Goodwin says, worry less about design and more about human-centered decisions. And I couldn't agree with this anymore. Remember those data breaches I mentioned earlier that I said might not be related to design? Well, it turns out that some of them very well could have been. Mike Montero says, everyone remembers the monster but they call him by his maker's name. Don't be the asshole whose name is associated with unsustainable, inaccessible, unethical, irresponsible products, designs, or experiences. We can do a lot better as people and as designers. Thanks. I see some clapping and some hands up um, on the video. Thanks, Andy. That was such an amazing, amazing talk. Really appreciate your really thoughtful approach to this topic.
Um, tons of people in the chat clapping, um, giving you props for that. That was really, really engaging. So um, thank you. Um, so I do have some really awesome questions from the chat. Um, uh, one question that just came in uh, most recently is, how do you persuade your teammates or bosses who believe in designing for 80% of users uh, that making sure your tools are accessible and inclusive, even if they, they make a smaller percentage of your target? Like, what do you do in that case? I think we just really have to point out how even though our smaller user set needs more accessible designs, what we have to do is really point out how designing for that 20% makes it better for the 80% as well. And we've seen that with other examples of, you know, that I, I shared earlier, um, you know, even things like text messaging or the way that we can use an Amazon Alexa now, like these are products that were created to solve a problem that was for somebody who was disabled or uh, different than we were. And it ended up helping everybody and creating a better design for everyone. The curb cut was another great example of that. So, I mean, definitely through user testing, right? Like design for, I, I don't want to say design for the edge case, but I don't want to say not to design for the edge case, right? So that's not the greatest thing to say. Like I've just given you two separate answers, but ultimately pick the design that works best for everyone. Test that, prove to your team, prove to your boss, prove to your company that that actually does work for everyone. And it makes sense. It's, it might be a little bit, it shouldn't even be that much harder to implement. The only reason it would be harder to implement is if you've already gone down the path of, you, you've got to patch something that's either old technology, legacy system that probably needs to be replaced anyway. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I know that sometimes um, metrics matter in the businesses that we work for. And another question that came in is, um, sometimes it feels like unethical design ends up being more profitable, at least in the short term. How do we convince companies to shift their practices when it may affect the bottom line? So similar to the other question, but uh, a little bit different. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the unethical designs might be profitable for a quick hit, but people are going to feel like they were cheated or, they're gonna feel dissatisfied or they're gonna feel like the company got one over on them and that will affect the relationship they have with the company going forward. Think about bad experiences you've had and how you're like, I'm never gonna use that company again, but you actually do. It's because you weren't, you, you were kind of frustrated from them, but think about times that you were actually like cheated out of money or hurt in a way that like caused a lot of emotional harm or damage those companies are not going to get your business again. So it's just, I mean, I, I can't imagine in 2020 that there are still companies that want to do the wrong thing. I, I think if you're working for a company that's sole purpose is to scam people out of something, then you probably don't want to work there. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So um, related to that, but maybe instead of thinking just about customer retention and happiness, how can ethical design be profitable? In what ways have you seen that? Oh, it, I mean, it's just brand value over time. It's customer loyalty. It's, you know, being seen in the same light as these companies that are like the apples and, you know, think about the most ethical companies you can think of the Patagonias, right? I mean, yeah. people have such love for those companies and those brands that, it's definitely, you know, important to, to understand that it's a, a long relationship that you're building with people over time and it's not going to happen overnight, but it's building trust. It's establishing trust and there's nothing more powerful than trust. And once that trust is broken, it's really hard, if even possible to, to recover from that. Yeah, Absolutely. So I know in some of your examples, you talked about um, some of the shame or fear-based motivation. And as designers, we're always trying to think about how to get users to change their behavior to do something in a different way, right? You know, that's how we um, sometimes solve problems. So what is the flip side of that fear and shame-based motivation? And how can, we, how can we encourage positive motivation? 
Yeah, so it's reinforcing positive behavior. It's adding pieces of delight to something. It's, you know, maybe you're rewarded for, I, I don't want to talk gamification, but it's interactions that make you feel good about doing this. It's when you log into, you know, your Robinhood account and you see different charts that go up and different shades of green. And it, it's just those little, there are little pieces of delight that we can build in interactions to really in, reinforce positive behavior. And when people start to have those positive experiences, they feel like they must continue to make those. I talked a lot about making sure that people feel safe and loved when they make mistakes. It's, it's all about how do we give them copy in error messaging that makes them feel like, oh, I wasn't an idiot. It wasn't me. Because every time you do something, it, it's immediately like, oh, my bad, my fault. Well, maybe it wasn't. And maybe they shouldn't feel like it's their fault. So we need to figure out ways to help people feel welcomed. And it's, I mean, it's, you can tell it's getting late and I've talked for a long time now. I love it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, the, the goal is, and no matter what the question is, the truth is like, do the right thing. Make sure you're doing it. It's going to pay off in the long run. No doubt. Absolutely. I love the delight and you know, positive experiences. Let's make the world a better place. Um, that is so awesome to hear. Um, I've got a couple uh, upvotes on this question of, can you be an ethical designer while also being apolitical? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think that politics and ethics, I, I think yes. I mean, I, I've not talked politics today and I've talked a lot about ethics. Uh, you know, don't create things that polarize people in a political spectrum. Um, yes, you can make the world a better place without picking one side or another in, in any battle, right? Yeah. I'm not saying not to fight for what you believe in, but I'm saying do the right thing for people, right? If, if you have a, a different opinion with, than somebody, like shitting on their opinion isn't going to make things better. It's not going to evolve the conversation. So it's the same thing with ethics, like do the right thing, do good for people, like I might disagree politically with my neighbor, but you know, I'm going to say hello to them. I'm going to like bring their garbage can in. I'm going to like still go outside and feed the squirrels or the baby possum that just came by my house. People might not agree with some of the other things that I say or do, but I, I still, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm doing good things. So, yeah. you know, you, you can't take every political stance or conversation to heart. Just if, if there's a way to educate people, try. But if it causes tension, then figure out a better way to connect with them somewhere else. Yeah, kind of, you know, be a, be a nice human with a logical approach is kind of how I'm taking yeah. your, your comment there. Um, we do have a couple questions about how to influence um, your stakeholders, your, your higher ups, the people that have given you directives and they say, this is what I want. And, you know, you're a designer on the team just trying to be an ethical designer. Uh, maybe the C-suite people are in it for the short term. Maybe they're, they know they're not going to be there for, you know, more than two or three years. Like, how do you make a difference in that scenario? Be, be the voice in the room that asks the questions that nobody else asks or that everybody else is afraid to ask. Be willing to stand up for what you think is the right thing and point out, I mean, you're not going to win every, even if it's not related to ethics, even if you're pitching an idea or you're getting direction for something and you don't completely agree with it. I mean, ethics being, it being unethical just makes it more of a hill to die on if it really is that moral line in the sand that you've drawn. But ultimately when it comes to influencing stakeholders, like interject, give reasons why something should be different than what they're saying, right? But at the end of the day, sometimes you have to go along and say, okay, I, I know you're saying this, I have to do this. But that doesn't mean that you can't create another version and test it and say, hey, look, this tested better. Or hey, this, look, I'm trying this. Figure out a different way to tell that story to try to influence that decision and never give up, right? I'm not saying go back 15 days in a row. But go ahead, design something that you were asked to design, show what worked and didn't work, and make a suggestion on what would work better. And hopefully over time, you'll be able to tell that story in a way and the timing is right, that you've 
got a foot in the door and they're like, all right, we'll try that. Let's see how it is. And, you know, if it's your manager or your boss or, you know, just figure out how to, how to navigate that, right? Navigating politics is uh, it, within an organization is, is a talk or a session in, in itself. <laughs> Uh, influencing stakeholders right. as well but just don't give up right I mean at the end of the day we're designers and we always want to improve things so think of something as uh, iteration one and, and come back and show them iteration two and three and four and why it's better absolutely never give up never surrender plant seeds yeah. <laughs> create that influence love it um, so we had some questions um, when we got into the uh, different technology pieces about um, like surveillance and privacy and when does personalization start to cross the line from cool to creepy to unethical? I think it varies on the product and the person. Um, and we, that's why we have to do research and talk to people who will use these products to understand where that line is. Because I, you know what, I don't mind you be creepy for me. Like it helps me sometimes. I, you know, if my echo is listening to me right now and I turn on, you know, I log into Facebook later and I've got ads for something that I talked about, I'm okay with that. So, but a lot of people aren't right. So yeah. you have to understand what that line is and make sure you don't cross it and figure out how you can help people. The, the goal of all of these products is actually to help people. This personalization is to make things better for people you want to make sure that you're not creeping people out. That's a great point. Trying to understand the context because to some, it could be cool to some, it could be creepy and understanding that and designing that into your product sounds like that's the most important piece. And then if it's cool to some and creepy to others, then you have to put settings in there so that they have a more. <laughs> it's a whole other design there. problem, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. So I'm really curious from your perspective and uh, as you've thought a lot about this problem, like which, which industries or companies are the biggest offenders of unethical design? Like, what have you seen? You know, I, I feel like there's a lot of little companies that pop up in times like these that you see people are selling masks and they're ripping people off or people are selling, you know, COVID cures and, and they're taking people's money. Um, I, I don't want to say that there's a, company offhand that's like oh man they're the most unethical company in the world because I honestly uh, couldn't tell you that a company down to its core is like completely unethical um, if they are they're probably out of business we, we've seen examples of, of companies that have really um, I guess think of like Enron right that's the last company I could think of that really went under screwing its employees out of retirement so yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just these little shady pop-up. I'm going to try to sell you some things, never going to give you a product and scam you out of money or scam yeah. you out of your social phishing scams, right? The people behind those, those are unethical, like garbage. If you're out there listening now and designing phishing sites, jog off now. <laughs> yeah, people taking advantage of folks in, in troubling situations where you know, the user may be in a disadvantaged place. That's, that's great um, context. There is an interesting question uh, for, from Teresa in the chat, anyone. Um, in a world too often driven by move fast, break things, I know sometimes we can fall into that. How can we as researchers and designers advocate for move slow, fix things so we can address some of these systematic problems that have manifested over time, both societal and software problems? This is such a topic that's near and dear to my heart that I have a trademark applied for the phrase gentrification of user experience, which I apply to some of this, um, of moving too fast, of what's, what's gone wrong? What have we done to our own industry that has made it worse for us that nobody like wants to, it, it's like a dirty word. And I think, you know, you could research a lot of things, uh, just going back to speed, the speed of agility is a thing, or these tools that people always point fingers at. But the truth is we have the ability and the, and, and, and the knowledge to slow things down. We just don't, we choose not to, right? 
we jump right in and say, all right, we got to get five sprints ahead. We've got to bang this out. We're only in this sprint, but we really have time to say, you know what? Let's get a few sprints ahead and let's look at things the right way. Let's make sure what we're putting out there is truly right for people and getting that leverage and leeway of testing and, and just making the argument of how much more expensive it is to fix something after it's been, you know, implemented or has to be rolled back there. You, you know, you could go through the, like, it's cheaper to fix it when it's on paper and when it's in a design tool and then when it's in code and then when it goes to, for implementation. So I think you just need to build the case of why we have to go slower. And I really believe that we do. I'm not saying we have to go at a snail's pace, but we should have the right amount of time to be able to design and test something. And that has to do with the maturity of design in some organizations and where design is positioned and the people that they partner with. And it really is, you know, for us, it's all about our partners and understanding and having empathy for them and, and letting them understand how design can add value and giving us the space to do that. Yeah. Yep. Great, great thoughts on that. So for all of uh, the folks on um, this webinar tonight, what is the first step we can take, you know, tomorrow or whatever first day we go back to work? What's the first step we can take in, in a, a being more ethical and thinking in this mindset? Like what's, what's the baby step we can do? The baby step is it could start with just being better as a person, you know, talk to one of your coworkers and, and start to understand them as a person, not just the, oh, that's my product owner. Like really get to know who they are and build a relationship with them because creating the right solution and designing things that help people are all about creating the relationships with the people that we're designing for. So take two minutes to go out of your way to really deeply care for somebody else and what they're doing and what their thoughts are. And then from there, like that will start to become contagious. Those meetings will start to be more personal. You'll start to build that rapport with people. And really like when you feel like you're a function of a team, then you start to have shared goals and shared values. And it, it starts small. And then ultimately, like it just, it comes out and talk about good things, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things we can do, but it just starts with being, being good to someone else and just letting that. that be contagious. Be a good human, care for others, create relationships. That's, that's all the good feels tonight from you, Andy. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have one final question. Um, there were a lot of questions on the chat about this. It's a really, really good question. Can you please um, tell us a little bit about what's going on with the shoes in your background? Yes. So um, <laughs> I, I have an office. I'm fortunate enough to have an office downstairs, but my wife also works from home primarily. I don't, uh, but I am now. So I've moved upstairs into my shoe room for today. Uh, like sneakers i have uh i think i hit a i'm embarrassed to say it 160 pairs wow um, I, I i've got this is my reebok my uh i said reebok this is adidas side these are some yeezys that side is the uh nike side i uh am more and more embarrassed by my shoe collection every day it used to bring me joy i i'm debating uh do i need this many shoes obviously not but um you know, it's, that is it's awesome. the, the one vice that I have. <laughs> so uh, the researchers in the group want to know, you know, how do you keep them organized and uh, which one is your, which, which shoe is your favorite? So they are actually organized by box, um, which is by model. I, I should have a nicer display for them because it doesn't tell you the color. And so you really read the weird things like this one here says mist. Like, I don't know what mist is or there's weird codes, but I, you just, you start to know. I mean, I can, I can look and tell what they are. And, and my favorite, um, you know what? I, I would imagine they're lids, right? You, you can't pick one favorite. Yeah. I, there are a few that I'm like, why do I have them? But um, yeah. No, I don't. I honestly don't have a favorite. I, I really love the how comfortable the Yeezys are, the Yeezy 500s. But 
I wish I knew more about shoes to understand, but I will be Googling that later tonight to check it out. Um, but uh, Andy, this was so great. Thank you very much for your really um, thoughtful presentation tonight. I think that's all made us think a little bit deeper about some of our design decisions and uh, hopefully everybody takes what they've learned back to their, to their jobs and they're spreading the love um, in their way. Um, I think you mentioned you will be sending us your uh, deck so we can uh, make yes. that accessible to everybody. So um, that is great. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, and have a great uh, evening. We appreciate you.